Shabbat Shalom. My name is Pam Faulkner, and it's my great honor to have been asked to speak to you on this Shabbat closest to Veterans Day. Rabbi Geffen asked me to say a few words regarding how my Judaism and my Jewish identity influenced my military experience. I served proudly in the U.S. Navy for a bit over nine years, from 1982 until 92. Four as a midshipman during my college years at the University of Maine, and then another nearly six years as an officer on active duty. It was a time when women were rarely found and even more rarely welcomed in the uniformed service as anything other than nurses or in administrative capacities. The first woman, in fact, to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis did so in 1980. After my own college graduation and commissioning as an ensign, I was ordered to report to Surface Warfare Officers School at Newport, Rhode Island. Of the 435 students, there were 26 women. After graduating some four months later, I proceeded to my first billet, the USS Lexington. At the time, the Navy classified ships into two categories. The first, ships of the line were battle-ready frontline vessel, vessels. The second were the auxiliaries or tenders, whose primary purpose was to service the line ships. Women were generally restricted to service on tenders. The sole exception at the time was the USS Lexington, a World War II era aircraft carrier upon which all naval aviators qualified to land on a piece of real estate the effective size of a postage stamp, which was moving, sometimes in the dark or the rain or both. Competition for one of the coveted billets for women on the USS Lexington was fierce, and to this day I have no idea how I managed to land one of them. I spent the next two and a half amazing years serving aside women and men who spanned demographics of age, ethnicity, experience, and birthplace. There were on average 90 officers serving on the ship. Of those, generally less than 10% were women. There are a few experience I, experiences I have had which can compare with being aboard a ship, particularly an aircraft carrier underway. The dolphins ride the bow wave while flying fish skip across the wave. Planes fly, arrive in formation, each pilot taking his or her turn at landings, which become less wobbly as experience and confidence increase until each pilot manages to hook the preferred third wire. The catapults fling those same planes off the bow to try once more or return to the beach. During flight operations, the rescue helicopter buzzes along the starboard side in a continuous delta pattern, ready to deploy when a takeoff or landing goes horribly wrong. The sun rises quickly from its first peak over the eastern sky as the stars fade softly. Storms bring, bring pitching and rolling, rivaling any roller coaster and climbing and descending ladders to get from one part of the ship to another becomes treacherous. Sunsets are staggeringly beautiful riots of color, and if the conditions are exactly, and I mean precisely perfect, just as the sun dips below the western horizon, there's a brief green flash. The day I qualified to serve as an officer of the deck, responsible for all operations of the ship underway night and day, and flight our operations for all types of aircraft, the commanding officer made a point of telling me that at the time I'm, under, I'm numbered one of less than 10 women in the world with that qualification. No pressure. When I left USS Lexington in 1989, it was to accept orders to be an instructor at Surface Warfare Officer School in Coronado, California. When I arrived at my new duty station, I became one of six women among 85 officers and senior enlisted men on staff. As much as any of the topics we taught, our jobs, job as instructors was to prepare young officers for the responsibility of holding in their care the lives of the sailors for whom they would be responsible. Officers are responsible for ensuring the sailors and their families are fed, clothed and healthy before seeing to any of those niceties for oneself. Among the courses I taught, one of my favorites was navigation. The ability to find one's way across a boundless ocean and actually arrive at a designated spot at a designated time without any road signs other than those provided by the stars and the horizon is a thing of wonder. Throughout my service, women were a rarity in the echelons of the military, much less in positions of leadership. As a result, we were greeted with widely varying degrees of tolerance and acceptance. There were the old salts who would ask if we could play bridge because they said unabashedly and to our faces that we didn't belong on the bridge, the deck of the ship. There were those whose apparent tolerance was a thin veneer for disapproval, envy, and even hostility. And there were those who accepted, encouraged, and mentored us irrespective of our sex. In every duty station and at every duty, in every situation, the women with whom I served drew together to support one another. We encouraged one another in times of struggle and celebrated success, large, as, large and small. Any differences we might have had were secondary to that which brought us together. What drew me to military service? First and foremost, I had been raised to believe that all of us owe a debt of service. I even once got a fortune cookie which said, 
quote, service is the rent we pay for our place on earth. My parents have maintained that they meant community service and I have explained that as the oldest child, they should have been more specific because I'm literal. I was also drawn to the inherent discipline required by those sharing a communal obligation to serve a cause higher than oneself. The oath of office sworn by every officer upon being commissioned is to quote, protect and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter, so help me God. An officer's oath is not to a person, an office, a political party, or even to the country. It is to the Constitution. It is a statement of faith, a commitment of you to unity, made with wholeness of purpose and in the sight of God. It is a promise to stand ready in the breach to defend the ideals espoused in that document from those who may seek to do it harm, no matter from whence they may spring. I was asked to reflect on how my Jewish identity informed my military service. In my case, it might actually be more accurate to say my military service honed and focused my Jewish identity. As odd as it may seem, many of the same things which drew me to military service had also drawn me to convert to Judaism. My Jewish journey and my military service actually began at nearly the same time. Having long found myself unmoored from the largely secular Christian upbringing of my childhood, primarily as a result of my inability to accept Jesus as a Messianic figurehead, a college Hillel experience with a roommate began my faith journey. Beyond the resonance I felt for the fundamental tenets of belief espoused by Judaism, I was moved by the faith and discipline required to maintain a thriving and vibrant religion in the face of overwhelming adversity. I appreciated that Judaism is as much an individual experience as it is a communal one. Veterans Day falls during that part of the cycle of reading the Torah in which we hear the story of Abraham. Last week's portion was Vayera. Vaira is, to my mind, all about discipline, tests of faith, overcoming the impulse to put the self above the whole, about how righteous it can be to oppose a superior on behalf of those for whom one feels responsible, and how we honor others. Abraham argues with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah, telling truth to power and winning the day. His faith is tested repeatedly, most particularly and poignantly, by the commandment to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Isaac displays consummate obedience and discipline and faith as he places his life in the hands of both God and Abraham. All of these acts lead to the promise of God to make the descendants of, of Abraham as numerous as the stars, from there to Egypt, then into the wilderness, then to standing at the foot of Sinai to receive the Torah, and finally to this day. As Jews, we affirm our individual faith daily with the recitation of the Shema. Herman Woke, the renowned author of Blessed Memory in his book, This Is My God, relates a story. He was a young naval officer too, serving during World War II on a minesweeper. Late one night as he made his way up to his watch station, he opened a hatch and stepped out into, onto what he expected to be an external ladder leading up to the side of the ship from one deck to the other, only to find he had stepped into empty air. The landing to access the ladder had been removed for some reason. He recalls that as in the moments that he dropped towards what he expected to be water and likely death, the words of the Shema came unbidden to his lips. He said he had always wondered how in moments of extremis one might remember to say the Shema. You can call it muscle memory or sublime faith. Happily, he landed on a secondary deck below and lived to write until his death last year at 104. Judaism cannot exist solely in the singular. Jews rely upon one another. The coda governing the need for a minion for prayer is but one example. We come together to commit to the unity of our people through prayer, the education of our children, and the support of Israel in our places of worship. We gather in person or virtually to support one another in times of grief or joy, to perform act acts of social justice, and to speak truth to power, regardless of the outcome of the current election. The tests we may face in coming days may, wish, may well shake our individual and collective faith. We may find cause to doubt the continued wholeness and well-being of our community. We may feel inclined to focus on our differences rather than that which unites us. I hope you will join me in finding strength and resolve in the fact of our history. I remind you that when we stood at Sinai to receive the Torah, we stood as one people, not as separate tribes. We must stand as one people today and in the days to come. What we must remember now and always is that our people have navigated these tests time and again, from Beersheba to Sinai and through the countless generations to this day. We have done it by standing together, standing together with the Torah in our arms, the Shema on our lips, and the strength of our ancestors at our backs. I am grateful for the gift of your time this evening 
And I wish you Shabbat Shalom, and in these days, truly Shalom.